Jacob's father had lived as a foreigner. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the son of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to it. And all the people said, Amen. You may be seated. Today we're concluding a series of messages called Rock, Paper, Scissors about making bad, making decisions. And we want to focus today on making bad decisions. Dr. Howard John Wesley brought a musical phenomenon that swept across the entire globe last year. It trended on Twitter, captivated conversations in cubicles, surfaced on blogs, websites, and commentaries on women around the world. For those of you who are chronologically removed or culturally disconnected, Lemonade was the title of the sixth solo album by Bay. For those of you who don't understand, that's Beyonce or Queen B, for those of you who do. Her sixth solo album, Lemonade, sold 550,000 copies in the first week, averaging $3 million in sales per day. And those stats alone guaranteed that it would be her sixth number one album on every significant billboard chart across the globe. Beyonce, a.k.a. Mrs. Sean Carter, who used to sing with the mother girls, has once again used her creative genius to redefine the music industry. For those of you who don't keep up with the currents of contemporary culture, Beyonce has become a master at releasing albums with no promotion, no marketing, and no warning. She simply drops them on iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, Napster, or Tidal, and they go platinum overnight. However, her sixth album, Lemonade, was not released on iTunes, Google Play, or Amazon. Instead, it was released as a visual album on HBO, and it took the world by storm. It was notable because as you watch and listen to the album, you're immediately struck by the fact that it is a transparent, empowering insight into the personal and real struggles that Beyonce has had with her family and her marriage. In sharing her struggles, we are all reminded that every single one of us will meet and manage similar struggles at some point in our lives. The title of the visual chapters of her album read like a course on spiritual formation, intuition, denial, anger, apathy, emptiness, accountability, reformation, forgiveness, resurrection, hope, and redemption. As you listen to it, you discover it's an album about reconciling broken relationships, overcoming hardships and disappointments. It's an album about confronting your own demons, both inherited and created, seeking triumph in the midst of adversity, turning things around, finding ways to forgive those who have failed you, and recovering from bad decisions. Have you ever made a bad decision? decision in your life. I'm just searching for a few honest people who came to church. Because let me quickly suggest to you today that the power of her album was not in the music, but in the message. Because if Beyonce, with all of her success, can still struggle, if Beyonce, with all of her celebrity, still has crises, if Beyonce, with all of her prosperity, still knows pain, if Beyonce, with her fine, I mean, rose boxing fine self, 
can still have to face and fight infidelity in her marriage. It's a sobering reminder to all of us that there is no level of income, education, authority, fame, or celebrity that will grant you immunity from the rugged realities of this life. Life happens to everybody. Loss happens to everybody. Lies, disappointment, rejection, hurt, heartache happen to everybody. And everybody, if you live long enough, will make some bad decisions from which you have to struggle to recover. Can I have an amen right there? The title of that album is Lemonade, which is a tribute to Beyonce's grandmother, Agnes Darion, who according to her own reflection, spun gold out of this hard life, conjured beauty from the things left behind, and found healing where it did not live. Near the end of the visual album, we are transported to the 90th birthday party of Jay-Z's grandmother, Hattie, who drives home the real and relevant cliche when she says, life gave me lemons, but I decided to make some lemonade. Lemonade is a reminder that it's not what life gives to you that really matters for you, but it's how you meet it and how you manage it. That when bad things happen, they either define you, destroy you, or develop you. And this is a great life lesson we all should try to learn and teach others early. How to take adversity and make advantage. How to take failure and find success. How to translate minimum wage into maximum wealth. How to get knocked down but get back up again. And how to make bad decisions but still bounce back and recover. I recognize in coming here today that maybe Beyonce is a little too contemporary for this crowd, but I want to suggest to you that no matter how old you are, the album might be new, but the message is definitely not. Because we all learn from the gospel according to Gladys Knight back in 1973. Yeah, I'm in the right decade now. Gladys Knight sang, I really got to use my imagination to think of a reason to keep on keeping on. I've got to make the best of, best of. Yeah, see, I knew y'all was lying. Amen. A bad situation because no matter how bad a situation or decision was or is, you can't let it kill you. You can't let it conquer you. You can't let it confine you. You can't let it contain you. You can't let it control you. You have to face and embrace the bad decisions you have made and those made by others that have negatively affected your life and declare that by the grace of God, I'm going to turn these lemons into some lemonade. Have I got any lemonade people here today? People who have made up your mind that despite the mistakes, the wrong turns, and the bad decisions in my past, I will not permit my past to dictate my future. Where you at up in here today? Because if you have ever struggled with bad decisions, you can identify with the characters in our textual chronicle today. This text is riveted with bad decisions. The drama centers on Joseph. His family history is enough to make an exceptional reality show or a great soap opera. His father, Jacob, worked for his future father-in-law for seven years to try to win his mother's hand in marriage. Then at the conclusion of the employment contract, his father-in-law deceived Jacob into marrying his oldest daughter, Leah. Everybody say bad decision. He ultimately married both sisters, but Leah gave birth to six sons before Rachel ever became pregnant with one. But Jacob doted over the one, showing favoritism to him, and as we read together, even providing for him a coat of many colors, a symbolic mark of distinction and royalty. Everybody say bad decision. <laughs> Joseph flaunted his favoritism and his boasting evoked jealousy and envy in his siblings. Joseph's rift became rivalry and sibling rivalry can be a dangerous thing. When 
and brothers and sisters who should be connected end up competing for the love, affection, attention, and applause of their parents. It can be a dangerous circumstance. And so it was in the text. His brothers mistreat him. They plan to kill him, but ultimately sell him into slavery. Somebody say, bad decision. See, this textual landscape is littered with bad decisions. Give me a moment to walk you through them, because note again that Joseph was the son born to Jacob in his old age. He was not only a cherished child, but he was a visible reminder that the old man still had. He was Jacob's favorite. Everybody shout favorite. favorite. Now we already know how this works because we've seen it in our own families. It's a challenge for parents to give appropriate amounts of love and affection to every child. Have you ever noticed how photo albums tend to be different for different kids based on their birth order? The first child's photo album has 471 pictures in it. The next child has 230. The third child has 104, and if you're born after that, you better wear a name tag so they don't forget who you are. See, we know how this works. When the old other boys of the family would walk into the room where Jacob was, he would ask them about their work and about the flocks. But when Joseph walked into the room, his face would glow and his eyes would twinkle. In social settings, Jacob bragged about Joseph. On trips, Joseph was the one riding up front. Joseph got to stay up later, stay out longer, work less, and get away with more than any of the rest of them in a hundred different ways, in ways that do not register with most parents. Jacob's favoritism for Joseph leaked out of him. Can I have a moment to talk to parents real quick? It is always a bad decision to play favorites with your kids. Children don't need to be treated equally, but they do need to be treated uniquely because each child is a unique expression of the image of God, the power of God, the love of God, and the grace of God. Each child is precious in the sight of God and valuable to God and therefore ought to be valuable to you and I. Jacob favored Joseph and decided to give him a robe. Now this was no ordinary robe. We're not talking bed and bath here. We're not talking about Sears and Robux. This is a highly ornamented robe. The Hebrew word used to describe it was a little uncertain because it's translated long sleeves. The King James Version calls it a coat of many colors. But let's imagine spiritually for a moment that Jacob went to the Neiman Marcus of his day and got this hand tailored, highly ornamented, full length robe for Joseph while the rest of his son got clothes off the rack from Cana when the blue light was flashing. What made this robe issue so explosive was not just that it was more expensive or better fabric, but that in those days, as in these, clothing was an expression of status. Come in this room. In many eras, my friends, certain colors were reserved for royalty. If you wore purple, it was an explanation and declaration of your status. In the same way, in many eras, slaves were not permitted to wear shoes. If you had shoes, it meant that you were free. Clothing was an expression of status. This robe designated Joseph as the executor of his father's will and estate, even though he had ten brothers who were older than he was. Don't miss that because blood is thicker than water until you add money and sex to it. This was an open visible, in-your-face expression of raw favoritism. It was a bad decision. Every time Joseph wore that robe, and he wore it often because it made him feel special. He wore it in the street. He wore it in the house. He wore it to the bathroom. He wore it to breakfast in the morning. It was a reminder to his brothers that they will never be loved by their father the way that he was. Every time he wore it, he 
his brothers died a little bit inside. The robe that was so beautiful and special to him was a death shroud to them. We read it together because verse 4 pains, but when his brothers saw that their father loved them more than all of them, they hated. Stop right there. Who are they going to hate? In what direction will their anger be directed? Who is at fault at this point in the story? Who is the person who made the bad decision? It's not the son, it's the daddy. It's not Joseph, it's Jacob. He's the one that's playing favorites. He's the one that purchased and provided the robe. But notice, his siblings didn't get mad at their father. They got mad at their brother. It was not Jacob, but Joseph who became the target of their animosity. And I hope I'm helping somebody now because I believe that the writer of this text is profoundly accurate in communicating to us the way that jealousy and favoritism work. The brothers don't get angry with their father because to do that is to face the truth that their father loves them with a love that is imperfect and derisory. And to face that truth would hurt too much and hurt too deep. So they sidestep it and aim their antagonism at their brother Joseph. Verse 4 says they hated him. And when you finish it, it says, and they could not speak one kind word about him. They could not summon the power to share community with him. And that's what family is supposed to be about. That's what God was and is doing in the world. That's what God was and is up to in the church. That's the goal of prophetic witness and ministry to transform the chaos of human brokenness in the human community. But that peace was shattered. They couldn't find one complimentary, considerate, caring word to say about him or to say to him. Every time they saw that robe, these brothers died a little bit on the inside. And what effect does all this have on Joseph? How does the robe wearing Joseph, how is he affected? Well, interestingly enough, the writer doesn't comment on his character at this point, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to surmise that he grew up because he was favored a little bit flawed. I want you to see this in the text. Verse 2 tells us that it was his assignment to serve as an assistant to his brothers. Everybody say assistant. But for some reason, every time he gave a report to his father about his brothers, it was negative and critical. The text says, and he brought his father a bad report about them. Now, we recognize this in our own families. It's the person in your family who is with you watching while you doing it. But as soon as you do it, they say, I'm going to tell. See, he was the favorite, but he was also flawed. And what I need each of us to understand today is that the example of the father's bad decision affected and impacted all his sons. That all of them were damaged by that decision. Did you get that? That Joseph had dreams. Watch this. And in those days, dreams were considered prophetic and predictive. Joseph had dreams, and it didn't help matters that he could not keep his dreams to himself. Can I drop my kickstand right there? You can't do. Sometimes you just have to shut up and let God work things out. I ain't gonna get a lot of he and his family were out in the wheat fields and his wheat sheath stood up while all the other wheat sheaths bowed down to it. Understandably, his older brothers were a little hot under the collar because they understood what he was implying. Do you mean to tell us we all gonna end up bowing down to you? Notwithstanding or not understanding the need for diplomacy or tact, Joseph then went on to say, well, I had another dream. And in that one, not only were the wheat sheaves bowing down to me, but the sun and the moon and the 11 stars symbolizing his mama, his daddy, and all 
all his cousin them was going to be bowing down to him. And of course, at this point, they had all had enough. They got up from the table. They cussed under their breath and returned to their work just to get away from him and his annoying dreams. Can I help you see it? Because verse 5 makes their response real clear when it says he told the dream to his brothers. Listen, and they hated him even more. Note that word hate. Hatred is a viral emotion. It can infect a family, a community, even a church, and it feeds on jealousy. Can we get real for a moment? Because jealousy for all of us, speaker included, is one of the most difficult dysfunctions in life to own. How often have you ever heard somebody stand up in a prayer meeting and say, church, could you pray for me? Because I'm really a jealous and envious person. No, you ain't heard it, and yet it's a universal issue. Mass confession time for all the honest people in church. If you have ever envied somebody else's car, somebody else's house, somebody else's body, somebody else's marriage, somebody else's child, somebody else's boo, somebody else's possessions, if you have ever wished you had somebody else's skin, somebody else's salary, somebody else's success, beauty, wardrobe, hair, education, temperament, athletic ability, spiritual gift, or humility. Please raise your hand. See, all of us have been touched by jealousy. Turn to the person next to you real quick and say, welcome to the Jealousy Club. See, it has universal membership, and while there are some aspects of jealousy that can be comic, there are other aspects of jealousy that can be catastrophic. Now, don't take my word for it. Look in your own Bible. At the very beginning of the Bible, where there should have been community, there was chaos. Where there should have been connection, there was competition. Where there should have been alliance, there was animosity, envy, and jealousy. It's why Cain murdered Abel. It's why Isaac and Israel separated. It's why Jacob stole the birthright from Esau. And why Joseph's brothers could not stand him horseback walking or riding. Envy is rampant in the scriptures. And believe it or not, especially if you follow social media, you know I'm telling the truth. It is epidemic in our day. And it's built on a bunch of bad decisions. Several years ago, newspapers in Iowa published a true story about a classic love triangle. Two beautiful young women, bright and intelligent, found themselves grappling for the same guy. Tap the neighbor say, when have you ever heard of that? Amen. <laughs> But these two girls had grown up together, gone to school together, competed in beauty contests together, and athletic competitions together. Sometimes one would win, other times the other would win. But the competition became catastrophic when it came to romance because they were both in love with the same guy. He was putting the whip pill on both of them, and he had to decide. He made the choice. He announced plans to marry, but when one heard that the other had won her man, she killed the girl and left the entire community choked with grief. That story is tragic, but that story is not new. We have heard that story before. It's as old as the human family. Envy and jealousy enter, and the community is effaced, erased, and eradicated, and nobody here is free from this one, and if you think you are, you are probably in the greatest danger. Joseph is the favorite, but he, his father, and his brothers are flawed, and whenever our flaws go unacknowledged and untended, there is the potential for enormous fracture. Jacob, who may not have been the sharpest tool in the shed, sent Joseph out to check on his 11 brothers wearing his pants. See, I'm better than all y'all coat. 
It's amazing that Jacob had been so blinded by his own favoritism that he could not see the murderous hatred brewing in the hearts of his own sons. Naively, he sent Joseph out of the sphere of his parental protection. Give me a minute. When parents are uninformed, when parents are oblivious, a lot of damaging things can happen to their kids. I deserve an amen right there. Verse 18 said they saw him from a distance. The implication being that they knew who he was even though they couldn't see his face. How did they recognize him from a distance? Can I tell you? It was that role. In verse 19, they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Now notice, they did not acknowledge his relationship. He's not called brother. They did not acknowledge his personhood because when you allow envy and jealousy to go unchecked, you cease to think of that other person as a human being. You don't think of them as a person. You don't think of them as somebody's son, somebody's daughter. You don't think of them as as a brother or as a sister, you reduce them down to the one thing that they possess that you do not possess. Here comes the one who has a dream that we will never have. Here comes the one who is our father's favorite and we will never be. Here comes this arrogant would-be ruler. Let's kill him. Let's throw him in one of these wells. And let's say that an animal devoured him. And then we'll see what will become of his dreams. Now please pay attention here because Joseph's brothers, listen close, have a somewhat legitimate grievance. Did you hear what I just said? Because when you probe it, especially on a psychological level, they have been denied a father's undivided love. They are fractured with a very real hole in their heart. They have not received the kind of love from a father that they needed to receive, but their solution was to destroy the brother for the father's failure. And that's what envy and jealousy try to do. That's exactly what envy says. Envy says, I want what somebody else has. I want it and I'll do whatever it takes in order to have it. If I can't have it, I don't want anybody else to have it either. And if they do have it, I will have to destroy them too with my tongue, in my heart, in my mind. I'll have to kill their reputation. I'll have to slander their character. I'll undermine them. I'll say bad things about them. I'll listen to and participate in slander and gossip about them. And I'm going to spread it around even if I have to do it as an artificial prayer concern. That's what envy looks like. It is nasty. It happens in families. It happens on the job. It happens in churches. And it will assassinate any sense of community. And to the extent, my friends, that you find yourself engaged in that type of behavior and letting jealousy and envy have free reign in your heart and free reign in your life, no, it will destroy you and it will destroy the community around you and it should stop. Yeah. I'm going to be your parent today and tell you, stop it. It must not be so. Not in this place. Not in our families. Not in our community. Not here. Everybody who agrees, say not here. Not here. And everybody who don't, just take your whooping. See, they decide that the only medication for their aggravation was his termination. I'm in verse 23 where it says, So Joseph's brothers, when Joseph came to them, they stripped him of the robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore. The plan was to kill him, wait, but by the grace of God, Reuben, the oldest brother, intervened. And listen to what he says, Joseph's faith turns on a maybe. He says, maybe we shouldn't kill him outright. Let's just throw him in the pit. Wait, I pause right there. I slowed down because I'm a fast talker, but I slowed down right there. I kicked it from 78 down to 33 so you can roll with me. Because all of us ought to pause right there 
and thank God for the Rubens in our lives. People who showed up and spoke up to keep us from being tore up. Has anybody here ever had a Reuben in your life? Somebody who stood up for you when you couldn't stand up for yourself? Somebody whose intervention saved your life, changed your destiny, and altered your future? Here go your 10 seconds. You ought to thank God for your Reuben. He intervened. They didn't kill Joseph. They stripped him of his coat, but he still had his life. Boy, that was a shout right there. But since y'all missed it, I'm going to roll on. They took his coat, but he still had his life. They, they took his Nike Airs, but he still had. They took his gold chain, but he still had. They took his car, but he ain't got it, David. He still, and as long as you got life, See, let them take your stuff. As long as you got life, you can get more stuff. You ain't going to take my stuff. You, you're going to have to kill me before you take my stuff. Oh, no, I ain't in that club. These shoes are nice, too. Because as long as you alive, his coat. They threw him in a pit, but like any lynch mob, things spiral out of control, and they chose a different plan. They decided to sell Joseph to a caravan of foreign traders headed for Egypt. Finally, they would be done with him. But God was not done with them. I'm going to help somebody because when we are captured in the consequences of bad choices, when we permit our jealousy to seduce us in the competition and sever our connections, we may be done with each other, but God is not done with us. Read verse 31 and following. There's so much irony in this story. The brothers pretend they did not recognize the road. When the truth is, they saw it every night in their dreams. The road that had been their father's pride and joy now became the object of his agony and his sorrow. The irony here is that if you rewind, listen close, if you rewind Jacob's story, the daddy, he knew the pain of having a brother who was his daddy's favorite. I wish I had a few Bible readers. Because can I, wait, wait, because his brother Esau was his daddy's friend. Wait, listen, the dysfunction not healed in one generation will be passed to the next. Somebody ought to write that down. See, Jacob knew what it was to grow up with a favored athletic brother with hunting skills. Jacob was an introvert who stayed indoors with his mama and never really hit it off with his daddy. And using a goat, just like his sons would later do, he put on his brother Esau's clothes and betrayed him by lying to his father and stealing his inheritance. One would think that because he knew the pain, he would have resolved within himself, I'm never going to be that way with any of my children, but he doesn't. He falls into the exact same pattern, makes the exact same bad decision, and so do many of us. I am preaching to somebody right now who is struggling not with the dysfunctions you develop, but with the dysfunctions draining the life out of you. They are the same ones that scarred your daddy and messed up your mama. It's generational. It wasn't handled in a previous generation, and now you are struggling with it in this generation. Jacob favored Joseph just as his father had favored Esau, passing the pain down to his sons. Jealousy led them to deceive their dad just as jealousy had led their dad to deceive his dad. It's generational. And that's why sometimes when people say to you, listen close, it runs in your family. There ain't nothing you can do about it. It runs in your family. You know what you ought to tell them? This is the generation where it's going to run the hell out. Because God's power is stronger than your past. God's grace is greater than your flaws. God 
our strength is mightier than your mistakes. Because there is no fracture that God cannot fix. Well, I'm finished, but we can shout right there. I, I, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It is one of my favorite commercials of this television season. It's a commercial that advertises Clorox bleach. It's quick, it's cute. If you've never seen it, you want to see it. There's a little boy who runs into the bathroom. He is obviously pressed to use the restroom. He's struggling to unhook his belt buckle. And in a panic, he says, uh oh, oh no, oh no. And then he says, Mom, we have a situation. And the commercial ends for life's bleachable moment. The suggestion is that as you live this life, there will be moments where you trying to do the right thing, but end up making a mess. There will be situations that Clorox is a fix for any mess you have to manage. Come here, because what I can't vouch for Clorox, I can vouch for Christ. And I want to testify that when you have a situation that you cannot fix, if you call him, he will fix it. Have I got a witness? Won't he do it?